I hate it when my brother Charlie has to go away. My parents constantly try to explain to me how sick he is. That I am lucky for having a brain where all the chemicals flow properly to their destinations like undammed rivers. When I complain about how bored I am without a little brother to play with, they try to make me feel bad by pointing out that his boredom likely far surpasses mine, considering his confined to a dark room in an institution. I always beg for them to give him one last chance. Of course, they did at first. Charlie has been back home several times, each shorter in duration than the last. Every time without fail, it all starts again. The neighborhood cats with gouged out eyes showing up in his toy chest, my dad's razors found dropped on the baby slide in the park across the street, mom's vitamins replaced by bits of dishwasher tablets. My parents are hesitant now, using last chances sparingly. They say his disorder makes him charming, makes it easy for him to fake normalcy, and to trick the doctors who care for him into thinking he is ready for rehabilitation. That I will just have to put up with my boredom if it means staying safe from him. I hate it when Charlie has to go away. It makes me have to pretend to be good until he is back. Monday, I came up with the perfect plan. No one even knew we were friends. On Tuesday, he stole the gun from his dad. On Wednesday, we decided to make our move during the following day's pep rally. On Thursday, while the entire school was in the gym, we waited just outside the doors. I was to use the gun on whoever walked out first. Then he would take the gun and go into the gym blasting. I walked up to Mr. Quinn the guidance counselor and shot him in the face three times. He fell back into the gym, dead. The shots were deafening. We heard screams in the auditorium. No one could see us yet. I handed him the gun and whispered, your turn. He ran into the gym and started firing. I followed a moment after. He hadn't hit anyone yet. Kids were scrambling and hiding. It was mayhem. I ran up behind him and tackled him. We struggled. I wrenched the gun out of his hands, turned it on him, and killed him. I closed his mouth forever. On Friday, I was anointed a hero. It was indeed the perfect plan. We bought an old house, my boyfriend and I. He's in charge of the new construction, converting the kitchen into the master bedroom for instance, while I'm on wallpaper removal duty. The previous owner papered every wall and ceiling. Removing it is brutal, but oddly satisfying. The best feeling is getting a long peel, similar to your skin when you're peeling from a sunburn. I don't know about you but I kind to make a game of peeling, on the hunt for the longest piece before a trips. Under a corner section of paper in every room is a person's name and a date. Curiosity got the best of me one night when I googled one of the names and discovered the person was actually a missing person, the missing date matching the date under the wallpaper. The next day, I made a list of all the names and dates. Sure enough each name was for a missing person with dates to match. We notified the police who naturally sent out the crime scene team. I overhead one tech say yup, it's human. Human? What's human? Ma'am, where is the material you removed from the walls already? This isn't wallpaper you were removing. If God exists, why is there so much evil in the world? It's a common question, but it is misplaced. All things must have balance. Light and dark good and evil. Sound and silence. Without one, the other cannot exist. So if that's true, then God does nothing to fight evil? That might be your follow-up question. Of course he fights evil. Relentlessly. I am Dardlian, one of his most holy and righteous angels. I roam the earth, disposing of evil wherever I find it. I kill the monsters you don't ever want to know about. I crush them completely so you can sleep at night. You humans have no idea how many of you live because of the work I do. But what about Stalin? Hitler? Ted Bundy? Jack the Ripper? Well, those are the minor ones I had to let live. For balance. The ones I destroy are, too horrible and vile to survive. What's funny, is while I would wager you never have heard the name Dartlian in any religious texts, I bet you have heard of me. Americans, for example, have their own name for me. Sudden Infant Death Syndrome 
When my sister Betsy and I were kids, our family lived for a while in a charming old farmhouse. We loved exploring its dusty corners and climbing the apple tree in the backyard. But our favorite thing was the ghost. We called her mother, because she seemed so kind and nurturing. Some mornings Betsy and I would wake up, and on each of our nightstands, we'd find a cup that hadn't been there the night before. Mother had left them there, worried that we'd get thirsty during the night. She just wanted to take care of us. Among the house's original furnishings was an antique wooden chair, which we kept against the back wall of the living room. Whenever we were preoccupied, watching TV or playing a game, Mother would inch that chair forward, across the room, toward us. Sometimes she'd manage to move it all the way to the center of the room. We always felt sad putting it back against the wall. Mother just wanted to be near us. Years later, long after we'd moved out, I found an old newspaper article about the farmhouse's original occupant, a widow. She'd murdered her two children by giving them each a cup of poisoned milk before bed. Then she'd hanged herself. The article included a photo of the farmhouse's living room, with a woman's body hanging from a beam. Beneath her, knocked over, was that old wooden chair, placed exactly in the center of the room. The doctor pulled the stethoscope ear tips out and hung the device around his neck. Mr. Weatherby, all of your tests have come back negative and my examination shows nothing abnormal. Adam knew what was coming next. I'm not crazy, doctor. I'm sorry, but there is no physical reason for why you occasionally lose control of your hands. A psychologist can help. I don't need therapy. I need answers. They seem to have a life all their own. I can't hold a job. I'm under investigation for assault. I almost killed my neighbor. This can't go on. I'll try anything at this point. After two weeks on a new medication, Adam saw no progress and grew increasingly depressed. He was convinced that despite what the doctor said, it was not a psychological problem. That night, a frustrated and angry Adam sat in a chair and drank bourbon. Drunk and hopeless. He stumbled to the garage and started the table saw, then slowly lowered his wrists toward the screaming blade. Detective Armstrong entered the garage where several uniformed officers stood over the blood-soaked body. So what do we got? He asked, taking in the blood-splattered scene. This is a weird one, detective. How so? Take a look at the body. He apparently chopped off his hands with the table saw and bled to death. Armstrong knelt down. And? And we can't find his hands anywhere. It was 1 a.m. and Guy Halverson sat in his dark living room. He hadn't moved for over an hour. The accident earlier that evening kept playing over and over in his mind. The light turned red, but he was in a hurry and accelerated. An orange blur came from his right, and in a split second there was a violent jolt. Then the bicyclist rolled across his hood and fell out of sight on the pavement. Horns blared angrily and he panicked, stepping on the gas and screeching away from the chaos into the darkness, shaken and keeping an eye on his rearview mirror until he got home. Why did you run, you idiot? He'd never committed a crime before this and punished himself by imagining years in jail, his career gone, his family gone, his future gone. Why not just go to the police right now? You can afford a lawyer. Then someone tapped on the front door and his world suddenly crumbled away beneath him. They found me. There was nothing he could do but answer it. Running would only make matters worse. His body trembling, he got up, went to the door and opened it. A police officer stood under the porch light. Mr. Halverson? Asked the grim officer. He let out a defeated sigh. Yes. Let me, I am terribly sorry but I'm afraid I have some bad news. Your son's bike was struck by a hit-and-run driver this evening. He died at the scene. I'm very sorry for your loss. I watched as my soon-to-be father-in-law held his daughter's hand as he walked down the aisle. Tears streamed down his face as the wedding march that played in the background reminded him that, in a few minutes, he would be watching me hold his daughter's hand and slipping on her ring. He walked up to the altar and I took hold of her hand, grinning from ear to ear. It was the happiest day of my life. My bride's father got down on his knees and started begging. 
Please, I did what you asked. Just please give my daughter back. I glared at him. Shut up and stop ruining the moment. If you sit back down and enjoy the ceremony, maybe I'll tell you where I've hidden the rest of her body.